So uh, I am a reader in economics uh, in uh, uh, an agronomic university, the Agronomic University of Paris, which is uh, AgroParisTech now. And uh, I am also, um, uh, I, I'm not, um, I agron agronomist, I don't, I don't know, agronomist, I think this is a term. Yeah. And uh, I also made my PhD in economics, so that's why I have this double, um, this double training. Uh, what could I say? I am really engaged, that's right, in an NGO, but also in my f research. I work a lot for um, environmental NGOs, for, um, I would say, also some farm trade unions, like organic farming, uh, Via Campesina, and in France, Confédération Paysanne. You will see um, the text I will present is a text uh, written by, I think, 20 researchers that I coordinated with another one in 2010. And it was for the last reform of the common agricultural policy. <laughs> and um, for this, I was, uh, I was nominated f uh, during two years councillor for the European Commissioner of Agriculture. But for this ideas, so he nominated me for this ideas. So that's why I could say also that our ideas were quite important in the public debate at the European level. Uh, because we represented uh, many organiza European organizations, Oxfam, uh, Friend of the Earth, uh, Attack, or, uh, obviously, uh, Via Campesina, and so on. And you will see the ideas we defended for that. Uh, what could I say now? I, I, for example, I work also for the Ministry of Agriculture for a research program now on the milk sector. So now I really work on the milk sector. So that's why. Of, uh, I will give you example based on the milk sector sometimes because this is really my, uh, my, my field now. And um, what could I say? I am also, I often intervene for, for the European Parliament. I will go to the Parliament the next week also for, for the common agricultural policy and so on. So, okay. Um, I'm, I really would like now to present you uh, the stakes. So uh, why is, this, is it important uh, to work on agriculture and agricultural policies? What are the objectives? What are the problems now? Then I will present the common agricultural policy and the general history since the Second World War. And finally, I will present uh, the final reform but not, um, not so much because I think that two th the two students will precise all of this. So, okay, so just do you know um, what the common agricultural policy represents in, uh, in the European budget? In the European budget, is it, I don't know. The European budget is uh, 150 billions. What is a part of the common agricultural policy, you think? What could you say? 10%, 20%? <laughs> so you have a. I have no idea. No use. Uh, okay. I don't know if there is a. Oh, yes. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> the European, you know, the European budget is <laughs> that. Uh, uh, billions. Sorry. What is a part of the common agricultural policy? 1%. Uh, 1%. You say? 40 years, that's true. Yeah. This is, f <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> this is, yes, yeah, the third. So, 50 billion for the common agricultural policy. So, you, you see that it's a really huge. Uh, budget in the European budget, and historically it was uh, in the um, in the 80s it was um, 
90% of the European budget. So it's historically, it's a huge policy at the European level. I would say this is a historical peer of the European Union or the, the European um, policies and so on. And um, for a French inhabitant, this is 150 euros per year, per inhabitant also. So that's not, uh, that's quite uh, important. And also, uh, a, last, uh, a last word about that, for the farmers, if you um, remove the farm subsidies of the CIP, the revenue of the farmers is average zero. So all, all the revenues of the farmers average is, uh, is the same amount of agricultural subsidies. I don't know if it's clear. So, uh, so that's clear that the common agricultural policy is really, really important for explaining the agricultural today in Europe and we will see also in the world because it has a lot of impacts uh, on the agricultural, uh, agriculture in the world. So let's go to uh, the first part. Okay. Uh, uh, um, it's, it's fine, yeah. So the first part is on the stakes and the objectives of the CAP or what it could, it should be. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know. Ouais. Mais c'est aussi, j'espère. Bon, ah oui, c'est bon, merci. Ça va aller, je crois. Ça va. Euh, hop. Ok, that's fine. So the text uh, uh, which I want to present is uh, called for a new European agriculture, agriculture and food policy. Uh, it was financed, this uh, study, by Oxfam and by Friend of the Earth, to, to be clear. Well, ça va arriver peut-être. Recherche. Tout à l'heure, il l'a trouvé, en fait. Alors, Bon. Euh, peut-être qu'il faut que je duplique, c'est peut-être ça. Il n'aime pas ça. Bon. Voilà, so I can present without PowerPoint. Anyway, I'm beginning and... <laughs> non, mais écoute, ça devrait aller. Mais je comprends pas pourquoi ça a marché tout à l'heure. Écoute. Euh Sinon, on va peut-être utiliser leur... Euh ouais. On va utiliser le vôtre, je pense, parce que là, il n'aime pas ça. Ou étendre. Qu'est-ce qui lui arrive C'est bien arrivé à Bill Gates. Hein C'est vrai Bon, ça rassure. Alors. <rire> okay. Tu as, tu as une, une euh, non, lapstick. alors par contre, je n'ai pas une lapstick. Une euh. oui. ah, voilà. ah, merci. Voilà. Je vais le prendre pour ne pas l'oublier, ça. Ouais, n'importe quoi, ça marche. Hop là, ça 
Ça, ça, ça. Voilà. Try it. Yeah, yeah it, it works. We already tried it earlier. Voilà. Merci. So perhaps I'm speaking about the first challenge, which is the food security. So you know that after the Second World War, there was a, a big problem of food sufficiency in Europe, in every product. And um, for this reason, for example, there was a big, a big plan of subsidies from the United States, which is a plan Marshall. And, um, but I think in the 70s and 80s, the European uh, Union, which was the European committee, um, community uh, in this period, was able to be uh, sufficient in many products thanks to a very rapid growth of production of productivity. Um, since uh, for 50 years, we have doubled the, pr the, the agricultural production. So you know, we have doubled the agricultural production in 50 years. It's amazing. And it was thanks to a rapid growth of productivity per hectare. Hectare is a, a surface, okay? You know what is a, an hectare? More or less a surface of a football um, field. <laughs> Uh, so, um, we, we, on, we always calculate per hectare in farm policies, okay? So, the productivity per hectare per farmer, per farms, uh, rapidly, uh, had a rapidly growth, a very rapid growth, growth okay? And um, it doubled the production in 50 years, okay? Uh, okay, it's fine. So that's uh, the great story, and thanks to more machines, fertilizers, and so on. But what was the problem? Did we obtain really food security in Europe? I would say it's, we have really to discuss that, because we have a very unbalanced trade now. And do you know, uh, okay, don't look at that. <laughs> do you know what are the products uh, we really need we really need to import now soya beans, soya beans yeah the, um, obviously we have fruits and tropical products but equally we have also soya in the in the for the import so the european union today exports more than it imports agricultural products, but we are usually um, importer of soya and tropical products. So here, okay, that's no problem because we have difficulties to, produ to produce that, but we, are, we produce, we, we need to import that, and that's quite strange because we can produce that in Europe. Do you know why we import so much soya? Yes, we need to feed animals, but why don't we produce that? Yeah, but we could do that because we export other products like cereals. Why don't we produce that? Why? Yeah, there is no subvention, subsidy, and but there is a second reason. Historically, it's like a bit Yeah, but we need that also for cereals. 
That's why we don't have any trade barrier for that. Any. And we, we didn't have one since the Second World War. We will see why. It was a compromise with the United States. In, uh, yes, I think 50 years ago. And that's why now we import so much soya. And it was a political decision. And that's why also there was uh, an orientation of the production in Europe towards soja. We could feed the animals with grass. Okay, and with European cereals, it would be, it would be, uh, I would say, um, more reasonable economically. It it would be more reasonable environmentally also, because uh, the grass is really important for biodiversity, for uh, against water pollution, uh, for the quality of soils and so on. But we don't do that because of politic because of a political decision. 50 years ago, which means that we are not protected against the import <coughs> of soya. And that's why um, we are very dependent on that. We import, um, I have problem with numbers, uh, we import 80% uh, of soya, which we, we use for the animals. So 80% of soya, and it comes mainly from three states. United States, then from Brazil and Argentina. This is a problem economically for us because we, we are highly dependent. And for example, in the, in the um, 70s, there was uh, an export ban from the United States and it was a really huge problem for us because we didn't have any more feed for animals, okay? So we are economically dependent from three states for uh, feeding animals. Also, this is uh, an environmental problem for Europe because we need gra grass for protection of nature and so on. And we have less and less grass in Europe because of that. And uh, this is also an environmental problem for Brazil, Argentina and so on because soya means uh, monoculture in the states. Uh, it means also uh, land grabbing uh, and uh, generally very uh, industrial farming in these countries. So, okay, uh, that's why I would say this is a big problem, but this is linked to a political decision of free trade uh, many years ago. So we are dependent for these two products, but we export also many products, cereals, milk products, and, uh, um, ah, what? Okay, no, that's right, that's the main products we, ah, also, yes. Thanks to one product, we are really, really in export, exporter, you know what? And fortunately, we have this product for having a positive uh, trade balance, the wine. Yes, <laughs> this is especially thanks to the wine and to the alcohols. Is it because of the amount or because of the price? The price. Yeah. Only the price. Because it, it has a very high value. Yeah. yeah. But if, if you remove the wine, we are really importer of uh, agricultural products. So I don't know if, it's, if we can count it in, into the food products or not, the wine, but anyway, thanks to the wine, we have a positive trade balance in Europe and especially in France. Um, food security also means affordable prices for consumers. And it's true, uh, for 50 years, we have a decreasing a decrease of food prices for consumers and we will see that uh, even with uh, guaranteed prices for farmers we had this decrease of food prices from 50 years but now I would say we must discuss that because I think uh, because of the new situation we have very uh, volatile prices now 
and we don't have any more uh, 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 strong decrease of prices. We have a decrease of prices for farmers, but not for consumers. And, okay, why? Why have we a decrease of prices for farmers and not for consumers? What happens? Processing industry. Yes. And this clear that we have a concentration of um, industries for transforming, <coughs> for distributing products. And uh, we have here uh, many numbers, uh, many statistics, for example, mix sector. And we clearly see that uh, the value distributed is uh, higher and higher for industries and especially for uh, retailers. But for the producers, there is uh, a decrease of value. So we have, I would say, if, if I take the example of mix sector in France, we have the scheme, this scheme. Here are the producers. In France, milk, milk producers are around uh, 300,000 producers. Here you have five retailers which collect, I would say, 90% of milk, 80-90% uh, of milk, retailers and also six um, industries. And then you have all the consumers, so uh, yes, millions of consumers. So we have a very big concentration in the industries and for the retailers. And so obviously we don't have a free trade, a free trade environment and we have really a, a powerful a powerful um, a power of industries and retailers which allow them to to retain a higher value for them. And all the debate is now how can we do for having also value for consumers and producers and we will see that it's a big debate now because of the deregulation of market and prices in the farm sector. Okay, that's the food security, the question of prices. Now, nutritional and health problems. Uh, there is even more consumption of processed food products with, with large quantities of sugar and fat and increasing problems of obesity. You know, that's a really huge problem, uh, especially in some countries like England. Uh, there is a rate of obesity, a higher rate of obesity than here or other countries. But anyway, in all European countries, we have this increasing problems of obesity because of this kind of product of consumption. And we will see that the common agricultural policy can be responsible uh, also for that. For example, fruits and, le and uh, legumes are not uh, today subsidized on or they are not so much subsidized than the cereals, the meat, and so on. And there is clearly a problem of distribution of subsidies uh, towards health, uh, towards, um, towards products which can be seen as nutritional uh, today. And finally, obviously, you have, s you have heard uh, that there, there is a massive use of pesticides and more and more use of pesticides. Today, there is a, a new public debate on that. And uh, there, is, there are new studies on, about that, especially for the health of farm workers. You know, there are now we have, we have proved that there are problems of cancers and so on for the farm workers. And uh, we think also problems of health for consumers and inhabitants in the rural areas because of this massive use of pesticides, fertilizers, and so on, and especially pesticides. And this is clearly linked to this new model of uh, new mode of production since the Second World War. So you, you see that finally, since the Second World War, there is a, a, mod a model of production which is we must produce more and more per hectare, per farm, 
and per worker. So more production, okay, and that's what we obtained for 50 years. We have more and more production, we double the production, but is it fine now? Do we, do we, must, do, do we have to follow this mode of production? I will try to prove that this is not an objective we have to follow now because it doesn't uh, answer to the environmental, to the economic and to the social problems. And we must have now another logic which is we must increase not the production in volume but we must increase the value and the ah, valeur ajoutée. The the added, added value and for increasing added value we must decrease the cost of production and especially the cost of pesticide fertilizer machines and so on and we must also <coughs> obtain that without decreasing the number of workers because we have now a big rate of unemployment and we must also um, keep for us the diversity of farms, especially the little and the little farms, and we will see why. So this is the first challenge, the food security. Now I'm going to to show the problem, the problem of employment, which is very huge. Also, you know that after the Second World War in France and in Euro other European countries, in France, for example, we had half of the not half, a third of the population uh, were living in farm sector, okay? This is huge, but now we have only 3% in 50 years. That's a revolution in the rural areas, okay? But, um, in the, until the 70s, it was not seen as a problem. Why? <coughs> Why wasn't it a problem? Yes. Okay, that's why now it's a problem. Then at that, that time, there was industrialization, massive industrialization. Yes. People from rural areas were moving to a better life in some, into the city. Exactly. So that's why it was seen as a progress. Okay, that's great. Uh, great. Okay, we have less and less workers in the farm sector, but they 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 are needed for the industrial sector, and it allows um, a growth of productivity per worker in the farm sector. So it was seen as a progress. But in the 70s, more and more farmers criticized this development because of the new context. Especially in France, we, have, uh, we had a new movement created in the Larzac especially. The, the, it was a movement of farmers. And now this movement is called Confédération Paysanne in France. This is, um, this is perhaps 20% or 25% of uh, the votes in the elections of farmers' uh, representation. Okay, that's quite Significant, uh, signific significant. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's why the employment was more and more a challenge because of the change of context. Anyway, now there is a destruction of um, uh, thirty thousand employments per year in the farm sector. This is not like the industrial sector, but not far. Uh, uh, I calculated with the same source of statistics, 50,000 employments destroyed per year in the same period for uh, the industrial sector. So you see that in the farm sector, this is a big destruction. We don't speak as much as in this, the industrial sector about this destruction of employment because th there are not plans of um, Ah, licenciement, <laughs> j'arrive plus. <laughs> oui, of firing people. But this is a huge uh, development which, which needs to be taken, taken into account. 
And this is linked to a rapid disappearing of farm and uh, with a concentration of land and capital in ever larger farms. And for example, we had around 2 million of farms uh, after the Second World War, and we have only the quarter of that today. And half of farms disappeared in the last 20 years, which is huge also, particularly little farms and in uh, livestock and polycropping cropping production. You, you understand livestock? And polycropping, okay, that's fine. Um, livestock is with animals, polycropping with a diversity of crops in production. And especially these farms with a diversity of livestock and, and crops into the same farms, they disappeared very rapidly, more rapidly than in other productions. And we will see that it's a problem for the environmental aspects because there are farms which have complementarity between crops and livestock and animals. So they can use crops for feeding animals, okay? And they can use um, products of animals for fertilizing the crops. And this complementarity is dis disappearing with this kind of farms, okay? And now there is a specialization of farm in every region, for example, in France, you have crops which are concentrating around Paris, for example, into the big areas uh, around Paris. And the livestock, especially pork or cows, are concentrating in the west. Okay? But this is the same in Germany, for example. You have a concentration of livestock in the north of Germany. Okay? Schleswig-Holstein. Uh, Mecklenburg for poor men, and um, I would say little farms remain also in Bayern or in, in the south because we have a big policy of lenders which are very rich and they can subsidize them. But we have, you have a concentration and a specialization in some regions. This is the same in Netherlands, this is the same in England and so on. <coughs> and it has environmental problems, it uh, creates environmental problems. For example, in France, uh, we have big problems for respecting some European directives. For example, the directive for nitrates. You, you understand nitrates? Okay. So for nitrates, you need a, a maximum rate of nitrates in the water, in the groundwater, okay? And in France, we, 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 we don't manage to respect it, okay? because of this concentration. And this is the same in Germany for other directives like phosphates. Uh, this is the same uh, in Netherlands. In Netherlands, they needed an exemption for that because of the concentration of the livestock in some regions. So you see that there are more and more problems of water pollution, of soil pollution, and so on, because of this concentration and specialization of regions and specialization also of farms themselves. So, I speak about, again, the problem of employment. Uh, all farmers, um, there is a big problem for employment, especially in East countries. Or in France, we have only 3% of, fa uh, of, farmers, I I of farmers, but you, you see that um, in some other countries, you have really more workers in the farm sector. In Romania, for example, this is more than 20%. In Poland, this is more than 50%. Even in Portugal, you have more than 10% uh, of population in the farm sector, in Greece also. And there are all countries which have a, a rate of employment which is more than 10%. So if they follow the model of development, the mode of development of France or United Kingdom, you see that they, they will lost a lot, a lot of employment, okay? So, can they follow the, the development, the economic development and the farm development of, con of other countries like in, like in, uh, in the West? I, I think this is really difficult and it will create many, many problems of employment. This is clear for you? Okay. 
So in all these countries, and you, you see that in United Kingdom, you have only less than 1% of workers now in agriculture because they are clearly specialized in other sectors. But anyway, we cannot follow this in other countries like East Portugal or, or Poland or Romania or Bulgaria and so on. And this is, um, uh, this is really a challenge because in all these countries, Greece, so here this is the size, the physical size of the farms. Um, in France, the physical far, uh, size is around uh, 50 hectares, but in Romania, this is one or two hectares. In Greece, I think this is six hectares. Okay? In Poland, this is five or ten hectares average. So, uh, uh, and many farms are for uh, consumption of the family. Mm -hmm. Or half of production is for the family of the, or the entire production. And they are really important for the economy because it prevents, it prevents uh, big poverty in the towns. And if we have the same development as in France or in the United Kingdom, they won't have industrial sector for feeding these workers. So it means, I think it will mean more poverty in the towns and so on. Okay? So that's why it's a big, a huge problem now in its countries and also in countries like Greece. Well, uh, I will. Uh, problems of farm incomes also, they are, uh, they are more and more volatile. Here you have the development of the, in France, huh, the case of France, you have the development of the income, the average income in economics, and here you have the development of the farm income, which is really, really volatile, we will see why. Environmental uh, challenges, I already spoke about that. But especially for the climate question, around 10% of Europe's greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, especially of methane because of the cause. But anyway, uh, that's difficult to speak about that because this is uh, quite complicated. But here, the nitrous oxide is a, a very powerful gas um, and it is caused by the fertilizers. So you see that Part of the problem is this kind of development of agriculture. There is also an increased use of fossil energy. Also negative impacts on biodiversity from this intensive farming. Biodiversity, water quality and soil quality. Because especially the decreasing of organic matter which is needed for, uh, for the production anyway but also because there is a monoculture specialization. For example, we produce maize year per year and we remove any rotation of crops. And for example, this is really bad for environment and for, environment and for farm production. Why? Well, um, we were late, so I have still 15 minutes. Ah, okay, that's fine, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> so this was the first part about the challenges. Now, a short history of the CAP and lessons to be learned. So, you know that after the Second World War, there was a Treaty of Rome, and with six member states, especially France and Germany, uh, which were uh, the couple of member states which uh, had had a compromise on, um, on the European policies, creation of European institutions, but what is important for agriculture, a common market of agricultural goods, okay, which means after the Second World War, you don't have any more trade barriers between the six member states. And this is really, really important. And we accepted that in France um, in exchange of a, a huge common agricultural policy. We will see how it was organized. And finally, a common external trade policy. Here also, this is really important for the agricultural sector. This means that 
we don't negotiate as a France, as a French government, the international uh, trade negotiations. Now we negotiate uh, at a European level. Okay. So you know that in the WTO, France isn't vo doesn't vote. The European Union votes. Okay. For the free trade ag agreements, we don't vote itself. Uh, the France don't, doesn't vote, it, vote itself. So common external trade policy and common agricultural policy. And why was this really important for the member states? Um, this was seen uh, as, a, as a, a mean, as a solution for the peace. Anyway, when you, when you hear now uh, the, the founder of this, they speak about the common agricultural policy as a solution for peace. We will have a common trade okay, of, agricult uh, of agricultural products, which were, was really, really important in this period, and it will prevent member states to make war between themselves. Okay? So that was seen uh, as, a, as a solution for peace, it was seen also as a solution for having a rapid development phase to other members, member states uh, of the world, and especially the, the United Nations, uh, the, uni no, the United States. So also, wh what was really important in this period, we, was, we were in, I would say, a Keynesian economic policy. Anyway, in this period, you had the idea the dominant idea that we must intervene strongly on markets for having wealth, okay? You must intervene on markets, especially on agricultural markets. And this was done uh, since the New Deal in the United States. It was done in every European state. And we thought in this period we must do that also at the European level. As we will have a common trade between the six member states, we must have that also. We must have a very strong policy and a very strong regulation of prices at the European level. And this was really coherent with all the economic policy of this period. And you will see the common agricultural policy was a very, very strong policy for regulating prices. We don't imagine <coughs> now, wh wh when you don't know the, the agricultural policy, we don't imagine how much it was strong for regulating prices and even the volumes of production. So what was that exactly? <coughs> so first, what are the objectives? The first idea is market is not an adequate instrument for the long-term management of agricultural supplies. This is not the good signal and it was said very clearly by all political leaders. And this idea was very well known since I would say the Roosevelt period and the New Deal uh, before the Second World War. And uh, Roosevelt was very clear about that. He implemented an agricultural policy based on this idea. And the other countries in the world made that also, um, uh, even before the Second World War. And so we must have a strong public action for increasing productivity of agriculture, ensuring fair life conditions for farm population, reasonable prices for consumers, guaranteeing food security. And this is clearly written in the Treaty of Rome. So how can we do that? Uh, okay. How can we do that? Here you have the price, the world price of farm products. Um, this, you, you see that this is uh, highly volatile. You know why? So you know that this is not like in the car industry or I don't know why, what. You have a problem in the farm sector. You have prices which change every time 
uh, and they can double in one year. And do, do you know why? Very, very quickly, I can explain that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The demand. So th this is really well known in the farm sector. You have a demand which is rigid. rigid. Okay. Because even if the, the the prices are very high, you need to to eat. Okay. The demand is rigid. The production. is also rigid because uh, when you are a farmer even if the prices are very low you need to, re to reimburse uh, fixed cost okay investments and so on and even and we can see now in the livestock production even if the prices are very very low you produce more and you don't produce less because you need to reimburse investments fixed cost and so on so the production is rigid. And finally, you have a production which need five, ten years between the decision of investment and the selling. Okay? So you don't have, you, you have also problems of anticipation, you understand? And for example, in the milk sector, in all European uh, in all uh, in all countries in the world, to be to be honest, you had very. In I, I, may, I make an example. In 2007, you have very high prices, so you have more and more investments in New Zealand, in United States, in Europe, and so on. So in 2009, you have too much production, but you had a lot, a lot of investments for, from all farmers with machines and so on. And what happened, in, so here, very high, product, uh, ve very high prices, and in 2009, what happened, which, what happens? Yes, that's it. And, s and you have this kind of cycles every time, okay? That's why you have a lot, a lot of crisis in the farm sector now, because we will see until the 19th, we will we, we regulated very strongly the prices, and after the 90s, we will deregulate prices. So now, uh, before you have we, we regulated prices in order to not follow the world prices, but you will see that in the new period, we will have prices which um, which uh, evolve together okay but so in this period between the second world war between uh, the 50s and uh, the 80s we regulated very strongly the, pro the, the prices and how did we that we disconnected European prices and world prices okay here you have the European prices, here you have the world prices. And we chose to disconnect these prices. How did we do that? Thanks to guaranteed prices. What is it? We, give a, we decide before the production that this is the price that the government gives yes. the farmer. So the farmer is, farmer is not going to suffer if there is a loss or like... Yes. Yes. Like something you, it is guaranteed price that you're going to Here. So yeah. But then the, the European Commission decides this guaranteed prices, anyway, the member states. Okay? They decided guaranteed prices and a level, every six months, they decide levels for every product. And how can we obtain a minimal price like that? What do we do when the European price? is here, at this level. What do we do? What is the way, the mean, for uh, stopping the decrease 
of the European price at the level of the guaranteed price. They buy the, they buy the products. And what do we do with these products? We store that. Okay. I have a question, but for example, if the price uh, not yeah. jumping as, uh, as they guarantee, yeah. any, anyway, uh, government will buy it in this price. Yes, they buy it and they, they make storage. Okay? The, the European Commission buy it and storage, and have storage. And what do we do with the storage? Export. We export it. We can wait. Okay, here. If you don't have big storage, okay, you wait for a new, uh, a new increase of price because we, you retire uh, products in the market, so the price increase, and you can wait and um, send storage after, okay? But if you have more and more storage, you need to export it. But there is a problem because European price is really higher than the world price. So how can we send products if we have higher prices? What? Subsidizing. Yeah, subsidizing. You subsidize with uh, the difference between the world price and the European, the guaranteed price. This means export subsidies. So the farmer obtain the guaranteed price, but it can sell the product at the world price. This is export subsidies. S this is seen as dumping now, but we had a lot, uh, uh, many, many export subsidies in this period. Not only European, uh, Euro European community, also uh, United States and so on. So export subsidies, and finally, there is also a problem because we have higher prices and if we don't protect them ourselves, we will import many products. So we must protect ourselves with variable custom duties, which is the difference between the world price and a price uh, which is higher than guaranteed price. I don't know anymore the name but uh, in English, but anyway, you have variable custom duties and so you have imports only when the European price is really high. Okay, Th this is, you, you understood? Okay, thank you very much. This is fine? Yeah. You had a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Is there any share of this um, stored food which goes uh, to other programs like World Food Program or Food and Agriculture Program when you have these excess? Yes, uh, yes, you have, uh, you can give it to um, caritative organizations and uh, Especially United States use uh, huma humanity uh, actions and they give or they send at very low prices products to uh, developing countries. But honestly, this is like export subsidies. This is a way for creating uh, the, um, uh, ways for exporting, so you know. And it was really, really criticized by NGOs of solidarity. Because when you do that, you destroy the capacity of local f little farmer uh, in this country, in these developing countries, to buy themselves the product. Okay? If you have poultry which arrive in your markets, which have a very low price, uh, you, you cannot be competitive, you are dead. And that's how we destroyed European community, United States, we destroyed um, much, uh, much, uh, many farmers and a, a very big part of the farm sector in some countries and in some developing countries. This is clear. That's why this policy had very good aspects and very bad aspects. Okay? We'll see how. Um, so it was done for strategic productions, crops, sugar, cow milk and meat productions, but not for fruits or for wine and so on. 
<coughs> and it was accompanied by a policy, a structural policy for familial farms, which means you had um, farms uh, could obtain uh, subsidies for investments, for technology and so on, which help to concentrate farms and to modernize them, okay? Uh, and finally, some objectives were, oh, uh. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, whether or no, <laughs> I don't know how to do, ah, okay, it's fine, yeah, okay, I think it's fine, thank you. Finally, we had increasing investment in this, uh, in this period. Labor and land increased productivity, production, and so on. Uh, decreasing and stabilized food prices. So we obtained the objective we had, okay? We reached these objectives. But there, is, there, were, there were also... Um, Yes, Th there was um, also a stagnation of world demand and exchanges and increased agricultural production in other parts of the world. So we had also a problem, uh, bigger and bigger problems for exporting because the world demand was decreasing in the 80s after the crisis uh, in the 70s and uh, the economic crisis and so on. There, there was a stagnation of world demand, and so we had problems, more problems for exporting. So it, because of these problems, we had more and more storage and more and more agricultural subsidies for exporting. This is fine for you. So as we had more and more agricultural subsidies for exporting, what was the problem with that? Yes, for other countries, and especially uh, countries which wanted to export themselves. And for example, Canada, Australia, Brazil, Argentina, and so on. And finally, also the United States. They created an alliance, and in the WTO, the name was the GATT in this period, they demanded, to the, they, they demanded to dismantle agricultural policies for regulating prices and so on. And the result was a big agreement in WTO, which is the, global, the last global agreement of WTO. This is the last one. <coughs> No, the, the general agreement that all the economic sectors, or many economic sectors, which mean, which is called a general agreement in the WTO, the last one is really, really uh, old. And you know the, the year? No, TRIPS is uh, focused on one sector. This was a, an agreement on industrial sector, agricultural sector, and so on. The year is 94, okay. This is the agreement of Marrakech. And it closes which round of negotiations? The Uruguay round, yes. And you know that the new one is the Doha round, round. But the last general agreement, it's 94. You don't have any new general agreement since this year. That's why Pascal Lamise and the new director and so I, I saw this pair. Uh, the yes. <laughs> That's because you don't have a general agreement since this year. But 20, uh, 94, was really, really important for understanding the general deregulation of agricultural markets in all developed countries. And we will see why. And there was an alliance between Canada, Australia, uh, Brazil, Aust 
uh, Argentina, United States, and so on, and they're demanding <coughs> to dismantle agricultural policies and U European community accepted. <coughs> so, because of these subsidies, export subsidies, countries, other countries were really upset, but there were also other problems inside the European community because of this agricultural exports and subsidies. What? What is the problem of these uh, export subsidies? Not so much. See the cost. <laughs> the cost. And I it was more and more expensive. Because when you need export subsidies, it has a cost. And one country arrives in the European Community in 73, which is, uh, which is now the first and the main opponent to the common agricultural policy. The UK, yes. And Margaret Thatcher arrives in uh, seven, uh, 79, <coughs> I think so, yes, yeah, 79. And she said, I don't want the CAP, I want my money back. That was uh, what she says exactly. Because the United Kingdom has a tradition of for, uh, for liberalizing markets and so on, so also they were uh, a big opponent of that. So growing UK hostility faced to, to the CAP, and uh, also, uh, so, how do, did we react on? First, we had a solution for milk sector, for example. We created milk quotas. This means you don't have to produce more than a quantity per member state and per farm. It was really efficient for the milk sector. So now you have regulated prices, but you don't stimulate too much the production thanks to the quotas. But it was too much regulation for the liberal spirit. That was a problem. Because it was a very good solution. Honestly, it allowed to uh, resolve the problem. We had other solutions for the crop production. For example, we uh, obliged the, the, the farmers to uh, not to produce uh, for a part of the surface. And also, it was a good solution. But anyway, it was too much regulation. That's why I don't have much time. <laughs> uh, that's why, OK, this is only the rate of sufficiency for cereals, sugar, um, uh, beef, and butter. You know, in the 70s, you have ob we obtained 100% of sufficiency, and then the surpluses. But thanks to the quotas, you can see that for the butter, we resolved the problem. So, um, <laughs> so after um, in two uh, in in um, in ninety two, we decided a, a big reform of CIP for deregulating agricultural market in the European Community, and it was for preparing the agreement in in. Um, in 94 in WTO. And so what did we decide? We decided to have a connection between the European prices and the world prices. We say, OK, now the signal price will be the world price for the farmer. And we don't regulate anymore the farm prices. This is a huge, huge uh, decision. And so that's why now, for the farmers, you have these prices like that. We need anxiety. That's why now you have crisis all the time for, uh, for farmers. And uh, for, for example, for milk products, 2007 crisis is here, 2009, 2000, uh, 2010, <laughs> and then 2000, uh, 2000, uh, this year, 2015, and so on. And you have this now. And the price can double in one year. So we decided that, and we decided to compensate in the form of direct payments. And direct payments are now um, 
distributed per hectare, okay? So now the farmers received huge payments per hectare which compensate this decreasing, this decreasing of prices. Um, okay, okay. Um, you will speak about the second PR. So we had also um, an attempt to take into account the environment and the rural development with the creation of some measures, environmental measures, which, um, uh, which uh, uh, favors environmental practices by farmers. Uh, we had also creation of um, payments for less favored areas like mountains uh, and so on. So you had some attempts to take into account also the environmental problems and the, for maintaining farms in uh, mountains and so on. But it was not sufficient. And finally, you have, on my mind, you, 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 we didn't resolve the problem of uh, environmental practices and for maintaining these uh, farms in uh, less favored areas. But anyway, you had an, uh, an attempt also to, um, for obligating farmers to respect some practices for receiving un, uh, subsidies. But anyway, uh, they did not manage to do it. And the result is, uh, sorry, the result is that now you have all these problems. For the distribution of, uh, of uh, subsidies, the subsidies do not vary according to farm prices. For example, in 2000, 12 uh, uh, crops farmers had a revenue uh, of uh, an annual revenue which were, was um, uh, 80,000 uh, 80, euros per year and uh, the producers of cows had a revenue of 15 thousand euros per year average in France. So you see the difference. So you have big inequalities of revenues and the subsidy really don't uh, answer to that. So subsidies do not vary according to farm prices. So they are not subsidies for revenues, for stabilizing revenues. They are not subsidies for employment because it is distributed per hectare and not per worker. Okay, and this is not distributed according to environmental services. And now I have a PhD student which is showing that if you pollute more, you receive more subsidies per hectare. And statistically, we, we showed that clearly when you pollute more, when you have bad environmental indicators in your farms, you have more average, you have more subsidies per hectare. So this is completely crazy. So obviously the subsidies have less and less legitimacy and the British and so on can say, okay, we have to remove the CAP because it doesn't have legitimacy anymore. And they are right. <coughs> so also there, there is now a very big problem of prices volatility. You have seen in France, or in Germany at least, but I think also in other European countries, you had uh, very, uh, if you have strikes or mobilization of farmers because they have big difficulties because they have a decreasing, a big decreasing of, uh, of prices. And so now we have this very big problem of prices volatility. We have also high inequalities of distribution of subsidies at the expense of little farms, of southern and eastern countries, of some other products like fruits and vegetables. We have also, th there, is, there are also risks to concentrate intensive production in the most productive regions and uh, risk to abandon them in other ones. Uh, also, in a free trade EU zone, we have more and more possibility to differentiate subsidies in each EU country and region. Yeah, this is a big problem and I will finish f with that. So, you know, we have now a free trade zone, but um, because we are not able anymore to decide a common agricultural policy between 
uh, near uh, 30 countries in European zone, okay, we decided more and more to allow each member state to decide some option of the CIP. So in France, you can decide this. Uh, in Germany, you can decide other things and so on. So the solution was to give to each country possibility to distribute subsidies as they like, as they want. Because we are not able anymore to decide a common agricultural policy faced to more and more different agricultures. And it creates distortions uh, of competition, okay? And also a last, uh, a last problem is that in a free trade zone, um, some countries have uh, lower wages, lower uh, minimal wages and so on. Or even in Germany, for example, there is no minimal wage for farm workers. This was an exemption in the last uh, decision in Germany, exemption for farm workers thanks to the f main trade union, farm trade union, which demanded to exempt farm workers to have a minimal wage. That's why they, they can be more competitive. And, and uh, for example, for transforming the meat, in Germany, the, the, the cost of transformation is really, really lower than in France. And there is a problem of competition in the free trade zone with different subsidies, and with different cost of production and uh, uh, because of the social uh, regulation, because of the environmental uh, uh, regulation and so on. And finally, we didn't resolve the unfair competition with poor countries. Why? Because we are still, why, why didn't we resolve it? And it will be my final world, Prom I promise. What is the problem with the poor country? Why didn't we resolve the problem? Yes, but why can we say that we have still dumping face to them? Why? Yes. Okay, we have a free trade zone, for example, with the Morocco because, because we have a free trade agreement with the Morocco. Why can we say that create dumping? Uh, not only because of the free trade zone, but because of currency, okay, perhaps. For example, Switzerland is really, uh, is really faced to that because uh, the, the France Suisse is uh, really... Uh but this is not the main problem. The problem is that we have a free trade agreement. Yes, that's it. We subsidize a lot of products. So we removed the protection, the barrier trade, the trade barriers between, for example, Morocco and European Union. But they, didn't, they don't have the means, like us, to subsidize farmers like we do. In France, we subsidize 10 billion of euros for farmers. 10 billion just in France from the CIP. How can the Morocco do that? So we can sell products under the cost of production thanks to these subsidies. That's why we can say, and the NGOs of solidarity can say that we have still a dumping. I even if, we the if the WTO says, okay, you are right because you don't, because you deregulated your markets. So for WTO, this is not a dumping, but for s many NGOs and for those countries, this is a dumping. That's why in uh, the WTO discussions now, the poor countries and the development countries say to the rich countries, okay, you deregulated markets, but the problem isn't resolved. And we must speak about direct subsidies distributed per hectare. I don't know if you understand that. But you know that the WTO isn't working now. And I think one of these reasons for me is that poor countries, developing countries are more and more organized into the WTO and then can say something now. And what do we do now for continuing free trade zone 
in the world um, without having coalitions between developing countries. How can we do now for continuing free trade? What? Yes, bilateral free trade agreements. Exactly, which is really more efficient now than WTO for developing free trade in a very um, good uh, power relation for the rich countries. Okay, that, that is my conclusion, <laughs> and sorry I'm quite late. And <laughs> So we start um, with a historical overview uh, of the cup. Uh, I'm afraid there's going to be some overlap uh, with the presentation, but maybe it's good to entrench this knowledge in your brains to repeat some, some stuff. And then uh, Laura is going to talk about the, the 2003 reform and the current state of the cup, what has changed and what the current problems are. Um, and then in the third section, we're going to present um, some criticism of the cup that um, hasn't been addressed um, so much in, in the proposal that has been circulated. Um, so we thought these are some of our own criticisms that we, we would like to add to what has already been said. And then in the end we, we present some questions. So um, looking at the historical um, overview, um, the, the cup was introduced in, in 1962 as uh, in, the, in the wake of this European integration process that began in 1957 with the, with the European Economic Community. So as we heard in the presentation, the, the main objective was uh, to guarantee food security, to make Europe uh, self-sufficient in terms of uh, food uh, products because of um, the sh shortages, severe sh shortages that um, uh, that happened during the the world wars, and so um, the, the approach was to protect agriculture from from market mechanisms um, in order to prevent the uh, price volatility and the uh, uncertainty for farmers. Um, so it was. Uh, as uh, Professor Trouville said, it was a Keynesian approach, so to speak, like an interventionist approach, um, where it was acknowledged that the mar market was the market for agricultural products was uh, imperfect and needed uh, a state control. So, um, and as we already saw also saw in the presentation, there were mainly three main measures to to get to to um, create this uh, constancy of prices. And that was, um, on the one hand, the import duties. So um, Europe would be protected from cheap imports from, from non-European countries. Then we had this guaranteed minimum prices that um, would be set by the European Commission. And whenever the price would fall below them, the European Commission would uh, buy up uh, the, the products at this guaranteed price. And thirdly, we had the export subsidies. So um, if there was a surplus that could be exported, um, the, the European Union would make sure that um, if the world price was relatively low, that uh, subsidies would guarantee that um, the farmers uh, have sufficient income if they sell their products on the world market. Um, and uh, the funding of the cup was uh, organized uh, through the European budget. And this is also um, yeah, maybe interesting because, uh, as you know, the European budget is uh, not very large. I think it's something about 1% of um, the, the G European uh, GDP. And um, so the, the agricultural policy is one of the few areas where you have um, um, funding really coming from the European level. Um, so, and then in the, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, you, uh, you had these uh, problems of overproduction. So, um, the domestic prices in Europe were, were, were relatively high um, due to these guaranteed minimum prices. Um, and that led to overproduction. So, um, you had re re literally these um, stores of milk or sugar that was not really used. And um, that was obviously like a, a very inefficient way to produce. Um, so then they turned a little bit uh, to supply management and introduced these quotas, so maximum uh, ceilings on the production of sugar and milk. 
Um, and they would export uh, these surpluses uh, cheaply, partly to developing countries and were thereby harming farmers out of the e EU. And uh, another problem that was discussed in these times were the high costs for the European budget. So uh, as a reaction to that, they introduced budget ceilings to, to put a cap on, on the costs. Um, so um, then between 1992 and 2013, they decided, okay, we have to reform the cup towards more market-oriented policies. We want to go away from these uh, direct price controls. Um, so they um, gradually lowered or uh, even abolished the, the price guarantees and replaced them with direct payments to the farmers. Um, they also lowered the, the tariffs and uh, enlarge the production quotas um, for, for these products like milk and sugar. Uh, a major step in this reform proce process was the, um, the decoupling of subsidies to farmers from production in 2003. So that means um, farmers would receive um, subsidies according to their farm size, but not to what they produce or how much they produce. Um, and these uh, reforms resulted in a reduction of surpluses, so that was uh, a success. Uh, they also reduced uh, grain prices in Europe, um, they reduced the fiscal costs, but on the other hand, uh, what was al also mentioned in the presentation, now we have this return of price volatility and we also have a persistence of negative externalities, for instance, uh, environmental uh, pollution. So this uh, is a chart um, provided by the European Commission that puts everything together. So here we start in the early 60s. The main concern was the food security. Then we had the crisis here, 70s and 80s, with overproduction. Um, and then in the 1990s, uh, uh, competitive was uh, the buzzword. So um, the idea was to, to cut the uh, the prices reduce surpluses and um, move towards more market-oriented policies. Um, and yeah, so now uh, Laura is going to talk a little bit more about this uh, 2013 reform, the most recent development. But one last thing um, here, this chart is also interesting because you can see the, the expenditures for the common agricultural policy. So here, these are the absolute numbers. The chart starts in 1980, so um, you can see like up to, say, like uh, the middle of the 1990s, you have a steady rise in expenditures in absolute terms. And then since then, it has been relatively constant. But um, the line here gives you the, the relative share in the European budget. So you see here in the 1980s, there was more than 70% of the European budget spent on, on the common agricultural policy, but this has steadily declined. And now today we are at the 40% that were mentioned in the beginning. Okay, um, yeah, now Laura is gonna talk about this um, 2013 reform. Uh, well, me, I'm gonna talk about this reform uh, the CAP reform, uh, it can be divided in two different pillars. The first pillar are the direct aid. And the second pillar is uh, related to rural development. In the direct pillar, there's a compulsory scheme and there's a voluntary scheme that can be like implemented by the, by the countries if they decide to do it. So the first pillar is more like decentralized at the at the total level and the second pillar is more centralized at the European level. So its country can be like receiving money from both. Uh, in, the, in the direct pillar, uh, the, the compulsory scheme, that is the scheme that should be implemented by all the, the state members of the European Union, um, has like three features. One is the basic payment scheme, that would be this the, the couple payment that Karsten was talking about. Then there's a green, a green payment uh, that uh, it, consists, uh, it consists of uh, maintaining permanent grass core, crop diversification, like in cr the creation of ecological focus areas, 
etc. And then there's like an, a special scheme for young, farm, for young farmers. And then there's a voluntary scheme with this uh, couple support. So th there's a the couple support that would be this basic payment, but there's a couple support that uh, is like uh, linked to the production. And, uh, and then there's like the, the su uh, supporting natural constraint area or the redistribute payment. And then they generate another uh, scheme for a small farmer which has like two pillars as well, but with another, with different condition. And in the second pillar, we find like many things. I, I only wrote here some of them. One is the environmental prote protection incentive. Then there's a restructuring and modernization measure. And the, the research and innovation funding into agriculture that I'm gonna talk about, uh, about it d uh, later. Because uh, here there's like a um, focus on focus uh, on the, the agrobusiness sector, and there's a, like a contribution of the European in Union in this sense. Well, uh, it's important to say that the budget uh, for uh, in this CAV uh, reformed is frozen at the level of 2013 with cut spending in both pillars, in the first and in the second one. And there's, there's another feature that we should take into account. For example, there's a removal of production constraints for some product that they were really important in the development of the cut for the, for the European countries, as sugar, dairy and wine sector, that is going to lead to a lower prices for this product and for problem uh, for the agriculture, for the farmer who are producing this. And then the, there's a, a strained crisis management with a different uh, mechanism. And then it appeared th this like um, an, an insurance mechanism for crop, animal and plants that uh, introduce the private sector into agriculture. And there's a reduction of payment per hectare as well, what is, um, is, is, in, is not uh, beneficial for the small farmer. And there's a removal of the payment ceiling for large land farmer. The, what mean that? That you could like a uh, bill, uh, receiving money from the cap, even if you have a, ca a big, a big uh, farm. But there's instead of, and then there was like a limit before this. But uh, instead of a, like a ceiling, they decide to, to set a 5% reduction of payment from the 150,000 euro per year. And then there's a, the main problem is that this, uh, this reform doesn't set a definition of the active fund. So each country decide his own. For example, we have that leads to a lot of problems. For example, in the case of Spain, uh, there are actually uh, uh, 900,000 uh, rec recipients of the cut, but only 400,000 400, are, uh, are under the, the farmer fiscal regime or another fiscal regime for farmer. That means that there's a lot of people receiving this money that they are not actually working as a farmer or working as a farmer is not his first job. So this future linking to the payment for per hectare makes the super rich become in the main recipient of the cap in many countries. And then here we can see the, the, the cut budget evolution. Uh, <coughs> We can see that the the decouple the, the decouple direct aid appeared in 2000, 2005, and now they are the main budget of the cap, while the 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 decouple direct aid that they were like the main part of the cap in the 2000 and in the 90s, now they are like almost residual, and it appeared this like. This second pillar here that could be the the purple the purple bar, and the greening that appeared uh, in 2015 
in both the first pillar, that would be this green part, and the second pillar, that would be the purple part. And we can see also, th which is really important, is that the spore refound were eliminated in 2009. That is related to this, mm, this uh, sign of the Marrakech uh, agreement. And now we are going to talk about some uh, our own criticism of the CAP. Um, the first one is that uh, there's no agenda for economic development. That means there's, there's a contradiction between the state uh, international cooperation policy and the CAP. For example, Europe is the main producer of agricultural product, which is traditional set as a, the, as a the comparative advantage of developing country. And Europe is promoting actually this, uh, this uh, comparative advantage in developing countries uh, using their, their, their cooperation policy. So here we, ha we find some contradiction. For example, we want to focus on the example of the genetically modified crop treatment in Europe, uh, which is more or less related with, uh, with uh, what uh, was already said in your presentation. But uh, here we are using another point of view. Uh, for example, Europe is the major meat producer at global level with 16% uh, of the world meat, with meat uh, production. And more of, these or more of these cattle are fed by genetically modified salt cultivated in developing countries as Brazil, Argentina, and so on. But these genetically modified crops are banned, are banned in many European countries and in the main producer of this meat, as France or Germany. So what Europe is doing is just to the, the they know that these genetically modified crops have a lot of problems, have a lot of environmental and health problems. So they are just leaving these, these countries to take those problems and just buying uh, this, that, um, that crops for, for feeding their, their cattle. So we think that uh, at the same time that European countries are implementing these international cooperation policies, their threat policies is destructing the farming livelihood in those countries. So there's a big contradiction. And there's another problem that uh, in, in, your, in your document you, you don't mention, that is the, the agribusiness problem because there's not an an upper, an upper limit of direct payment, and the 20% of the agro-business in the European Union, so the, the farmers, are receiving the 80% of the subsidies. Even these big companies, they have like a lot of lobbying powers, and for example, the nearly the 80% of the organization lobbying for the CAP, uh, 2013 reform were likely to defend agribusiness interest, and they have a, an economic, uh, a major economic power for lobbying. For example, uh, Via Campesina, which is the, the, the most important, the biggest uh, farmer organization in the world, they, they were like uh, spending 100,000 euro per year in, in lobbying, while, for example, Bayer. The, the chemical company was spending 12 times that, uh, that uh, amount of money. And now, Constan is going to talk about that. Yeah, last point of criticism that we would like to raise uh, concerns the distributional issues. Um, so we heard that um, the cup expenditures account for almost 40% of the EU budget. And that, of course, uh, raises the question, um, why? Like this? Is or like this? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, I mean, obviously, that raises the question, uh, is it justified to devote so much money to um, an economic sector that is relatively small? So, I think 5% of the employees work in agriculture. Um, I mean, there are probably also other sectors, uh, for example, the industry, as we, as we heard also in one of the, the joint seminars that are uh, really declining in Europe. And 
why uh, why do we give so much privilege to farmers? So I mean, this is obviously a distributional issue that um, can be discussed. And then there's also another problem within the um, support of uh, agriculture in Europe that there's a strong bias um, against Eastern European countries. So um, the Western European countries um, receive much more subsidies um, than the Eastern European countries. And I understand that uh, this has been partly addressed uh, in the recent reforms. So I think now there's the rule that um, every country is supposed to receive at least 90% uh, of the EU average. So I, I, I saw that there is some um, concern for this problem, but the, prob the question is whether this is enough um, given, given the, um, like the, 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 this has been prevailing over a long time. So uh, now the Western European countries um, have a, a strong uh, advantage in agriculture. Okay, so these were our uh, three points of criticism. Now we move to the questions uh, for you, but also for general discussion. So um, a first question um, concerns the, the political economy dimension of the cup. So um, this is what I, I found personally very interesting. So um, the question is, how is it possible that um, European farmers are able to force to enforce their, their vested interests so strongly? I mean, what? Um, lobbying and these kind of things, how, how does it work? Bec I mean, they, they must be really strong, um, strongly organized as opposed to, to other um, business groups, for instance. So how, how does that work? And I would also be interested to know, like, who are their main opponents? Like, who, who are, with whom are they competing? And also within Europe, um, which countries uh, are defending the cup and which are criticizing it uh, the most. I mean, we already heard the UK is one of the, the main critic, but maybe we could um, hear a bit more about these internal um, conflicts um, and whether there are any major changes to be expected. Um, a second uh, very concrete question concerns this um, very recent uh, WTO decision from the 19th uh, December, I, I just read that in the news the, um, that they decided to completely abolish uh, all export subsidies for farm exports. And I was just wondering whether this has any relevance to the cup um, because um, I wasn't sh sure whether the export subsidies have been fully op abolished before, so it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, and generally, whether this is good news for, for developing countries. So what your assessment is. Another, th another three questions. For example, uh, what uh, what consequences uh, have the TTIP? Do you think have the TTIP for the European agriculture and in particular for the PAC, for the CAP? Sorry, uh, in the and in the paper uh, it is mentioned the the effect of the cap uh, and the world trade organization policy over the developing country situation but what is the role of financial market in determining prices and what is the the role that the, that these market are are playing in the developing country situation in agriculture and my and the, our five question is uh, that um there's some international organization of farmers, such as Via Campesina, that suggest that Europe must implement a policy to protest, to protect themselves against low price import instead of promoting export dumping. What do you think about this measure? Um, so thanks very much because I think it was really useful to uh, this description and some elements weren't precise by me so that's really great to 
I think, uh, to have said that. Um, just few, a few answers to your questions about the lobbying, also the, the interest and uh, what are uh, the forces and uh, the organizations, the member states, which are lobbying at the European level. Um, I would say there, there are uh, three groups of countries, okay? Uh, we can see that in the last reform of CAP. One is uh, um, the group of liberal country, clearly liberal country. You can, okay, you can find the UK, we, we know that, but you can, s you can find also the north, northern countries. The UK, what is important for the UK is decreasing the, the budget of the CAP. This is the main objective. Um, okay, and um, but for the northern countries, there are other objectives also. For example, for the Netherlands or for Denmark, for Ireland, in the milk sector, what was important is was is removing the milk quotas because they want to uh, export more and more, and they can do that because they have. Um, uh, lower cost of production uh, in Netherlands, in Denmark, for example, they have bigger farms, they have uh, more machines. Uh, I can, I cannot the, the say the word in English, robot trait, uh, but anyway, <laughs> more machines uh, uh, for cows and so on. So they, they, they have more technology and. Uh, uh, that's why they, they want to export more, and for that, they need deregulation, especially it was the case of the milk quotas, okay? So, liberal countries with different reasons. Northern countries, okay, and also some of the East countries. For example, the Czech Republic, I could say it is in this group, because, for example, it's a Czech country, uh, in the Czech Republic, you find the biggest farms average in the European Union. Uh, this is around 150 hectares per farm. In France, 50 hectares, okay? But with a many farm with more than 1,000 hectares, which represents most of the production in the Czech Republic. That's why here you can have also the Czech Republic. Okay. So uh, then, so this is the first group, the liberal countries. And uh, they are very powerful at the European level into the negotiations, okay? Then you have the Latin countries, especially France, Spain. Uh, yes, Spain, France are the leaders. Then you have more or less the Italia, Portugal, Greece, but it depends on the subjects. But especially France and Spain, because also they receive uh, a lot of budget from the CIP. So this is why this is really important for them also to maximize the budget of CIP. But also they want more regulation and so on. So they have. Uh, yes, a position for more regulation. Then you have the East countries, which are really different, uh, which represent many differences, for example, between the Czech Republic and the Romania. And uh, what they want, especially, is an increasing of their amount of subsidies. That's clear. Then it's really difficult to have... Uh, um, to have more common points between them because they are really different between themselves. And for example, Romania, uh, they, this country doesn't want to sail to, to have a, a maximum amount of subsidy for farms in the last reform because they want a development of big farms in their countries. So that's why even the Romania is not only for little farms and so on. They also want very big farms. And uh, thanks to uh, direct uh, investments for, from foreign countries and so on. Okay? 
So this is uh, how it works more or less between the countries. And you know that in the, at the European level, when you have uh, a negotiation of CAP, you have the Council of Ministers, of Agricultural Ministers, which decide with now the Parliament. Because since the Treaty of Lisbon, you have a co-decision between the Council of Ministers, okay, that's fine for you, and the Parliament. And this is new. The European Parliament is really new in the negotiations. Before, it was only the Council of Ministers, so the Member States. Now you have also the Parliament. But the Parliament is really new into the negotiations. That's why f sometimes we say that they lack experience into the, these negotiations. Uh, uh, but now you have Parliament and the Council, so the Member States. Into the Parliament, I would say that very often, please, uh, every deputy follows the advice of the member states. So, for example, the French deputies are quite, more or less, have quite the same advice uh, compared to um, uh, the deputies of UK, for example. Okay? Except on some subjects, some special subjects, but I would say, more or less, you have the parliament isn't able just for now to have differentiated advices relatively to the Council and the Member States. That's the problem, but I think w that with the time it will, uh, it will be different. So this is a co-decision, but who proposes all the laws at the European level? The Commission. And one guy or woman is really, really important for the CAP. This is. And it can change everything. <laughs> I will take an example. This is a commissioner. The commissioner, so you know, in the European Commission, you have how many directions? How many directions in the European Commission? Okay. Yes, so? So? So 28, yes, that's true. And for very little countries, obviously we don't give a big direction, and for big countries we give a big direction. But the direction of agriculture is really important because this is 40% uh, of the budget. So you don't have uh, Greece, it's very difficult, or Slovenia uh, won't have the, the, the direction of agriculture. So the last time it was a Romania, a Roma, a Romania okay, Dacian Ciolos, which was trained in France, which speaks ver very fluently French and so on, and which was sustained by France. Okay? Now he's Irish. And this changes everything. <laughs> because Dacian Sulos, he was more for regulation, for little farms, for environment, and so on. Uh, for example, I, I was counselor of Dacian Sulos, and that's not, uh, uh, that's uh, for uh, <laughs> one special reason. I won't never be counselor for, <laughs> for, uh, for the new one, Phil Hogan. And uh, the Phil Hogan, we, who is Irish, he's into the first group of member states, the liberal states, okay, concerning agriculture. Dacian Ciolos, he was in the group of states, uh, more Latin countries, okay, East and Latin countries. And the problem is that the European Commission proposes all laws. Obviously, it proposes laws according to uh, the advices of, of, the, uh, of the member states. For example, if all member states want, uh, want one law, the European Commission will propose one law, this law, okay? But they can, only uh, they can al also have a, a big influence 
by proposing some laws and not other laws and so on. When, when there is a, a problem and a big division between the member states, European Commission can decide to propose this law or this law. Okay? And now I could say, uh, with the change of commissioner from uh, from Dacian Sulos to Phil Hogan in agricultural field, we have a big difference. And this is really more difficult, even with the milk crisis, even if the crisis in livestock production in Europe, to have, for example, proposal for regulating markets. And the European Commission, for example, uh, this year, because of the milk <coughs> sector uh, and uh, the crisis in the, in the livestock production, France and some other governments wanted to have uh, an increase of, of the guaranteed price. You know, you have still very low guaranteed price. They, they are so low that they don't have any wall for stabilizing prices. They are really very, very low, okay? And the French government and other governments demanded to increase this guaranteed price for answering to the crisis in livestock production. So, for stabilizing or for uh, having a, a minimal price which is not so low. But the European Commission didn't uh, propose it. And I think if they, if they propose that, if the European Commission proposed that, perhaps we could have a decision for, the, for this. But they don't propose that, so we are, we are uh, blocked. So it's just for showing you this power of the European Commission. And really, I leave that inside. <laughs> so I can really say they have the European Commission and the European Commissioner especially, especially have a big influence. And you say that the reform in 2013 was quite positive for some points. It's true. And on my mind, Dacian Ciolos made a very good proposal uh, regarding uh, the alliances and the situation and the advices of every country. I think he couldn't do more for environmental aspects and even for social aspects. For example, he proposed also a special subsidy for small farms. Uh, he proposed to uh, increase subsidies if, we, if a member state wants it to increase the amount of subsidies for little farms. He proposed green payments with uh, uh, more conditions for having them and so on. And it was clearly linked also to the advice of this commissioner of, uh, of the work what, what, which was done inside uh, the cabinet and so on, okay? Um, so I could say this is really important. Finally, uh, concerning the lobbying. One, one uh, sector of lobbying is increasing. This is environmental NGOs. So, for example, you know how many members has bird life in UK? What could you say? How many members for bird life which, is, uh, which protects birds? at the beginning, but now it protects biodiversity and many aspects of the environment. How many members in the UK? For French, it's, it's, for French, it's really amazing, to be honest. No. Three, three millions. <laughs> so you can see the importance of such an organization in the UK. And they think that agriculture is one of the is responsible for one part of the environmental destruction and especially the biodiversity and i think they're right and so they developed they have they have a, a huge budget and they developed a, a really great expertise which is now really um, recognized at the european level so bird life but also in germany bund has uh, a hundred of hundreds of thousands of members and so on. In France, it's amazing for us, to be honest, because uh, uh, we don't have such organizations. But at the European level, they are really uh, powerful now, okay? So that's why for the last reform, 
uh, they had an influence on the proposal of the Commission. The problem is that after <coughs> you have the member state which uh, discussed on this proposal and into the member states you don't have the same uh, uh, the same powers of environmental NGOs. And for example in France the main uh, lobby is not environmental NGOs and agriculture. What is it? No, the main one in the Ministry of Agriculture. So I am in the Ministry of Agriculture because I depend on the Ministry of Agriculture and can see that. And I think every um, worker of the Ministry of Agriculture will answer that. What is the first lobby? It's clear for everyone in the Ministry, anyway. I think so. <laughs> the? No, f n generally, the, the, f the main farm trade union, which is in France FNSEA. In Germany, this is the Bauer and Verband. In UK, this is um, the NFU, National Farmers Union. For example, in UK, they are weaker than in France because of the environmental NGOs, uh, the, the criticisms of the society and so on. But in France, in Germany, in Spain, and in Italy and so on, they are really, really strong. And you cannot have a decision in the Ministry of Agriculture without having taken in, in, in uh, account the advice of the main tra trade, uh, of the main farm trade union, it's clear. Okay, and uh, so, you, you, you have other farm trade unions in France, for example, Confédération Paysanne, Coordination Rurale, and so on, but FNSOA is really the main uh, advice that we have to take into account in the Ministry of Agriculture. And, uh, yeah. No. The, 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 ah, entrepreneur, the, <laughs> the entrepreneurs of farms. Yeah, you, yeah, you know that we have, we have an exception in the agricultural sector still. This is um, that we have familial farms. So it's not like an enterprise like in other economic sector. We cannot say that we have, uh, uh, that we have owners of capital of an enterprise than the workers. So generally, uh, the entrepreneur is, is also working as the, on the farm. So it's not capitalist structures like in other economic sectors. You understand that? Yes. This is, we have a development towards a cap capitalist structures. For example, in United States, in the milk sector, half of the production is produced by uh, farms which have more than a thousand cows. So we have more and more capitalist farm with owners of the capital uh, on one side and on the other side, the workers. But in France, you have still, still, uh, familial farms, but it's it, there is a debate about that. For, for example, in, in France, we had a debate uh, on, on one very well-known farm in the north of France, which is a farm with more than thousand cows, and there was a big opposition from the citizens against this farm, because in France generally people don't want to 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 make disappear these familial farms. But in other countries like United States, like some East countries in Europe and so on, we ha you have a very big development and rapid development of capitalist structures. But anyway, you cannot say that this trade union is an entrepreneur trade union like, uh, like the other ones, okay? Even if the president now of this farm trade union is an a very big entrepreneur. Okay, and that's why uh, there is big discussions about that. But anyway, yeah. 
uh, yeah, so it was about the interest. Um, and for example, the main farm trade union in France, they, uh, they opposed completely to the environmental conditions for distributing subsidies. So the proposal of the commission, they were totally against it because they want to resave subsidies without making anything, uh, anything more for the environment. Because they say, oh, we have so many difficulties for economic difficulties and so on. We don't want any other constraints, environmental constraints. This is not the position of uh, Via Campesina, which says we really must reinforce on environmental uh, practices. Okay? So you have also very big debates between the farmers about that. The main farm trade unions generally don't want more environmental constraints. They just want more subsidies or subsidies like before uh, without constraints. But some trade unions uh, want more environmental and social constraints. So, uh, this is uh, the first question, so <laughs> I really have to be, to be more quick. Um, yes, the WTO and Nairobi. Uh, nothing, okay, uh, we uh, prevented s uh, subsidies for exports in Nairobi in the last WTO summit in December, okay? Uh, but it doesn't change so much uh, because in, France, in Europe we don't have s export subsidies since 2005, I think. So um, this is not a big change anyway. It's just that we cannot do that again after. Uh, but anyway, I think that we will have a long time before a general agreement in WTO anyway. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the debates in WTO now is that some countries like India and others want to keep storage and regulation of prices because they want to secure uh, food uh, and uh, little farms and so on. And some other countries like United States, Europe, and so on, they want to weak them or to destroy them. And they say to India and, so, uh, and other countries, you are now developing countries, you are richer and richer, so you have to dismantle your agricultural policies like we did before. So that's why in WTO, I think that the farm questions, the agricultural question uh, will be a, a, a very big question and we won't have, on my mind, but we will see, yeah? but I think uh, it's quite blocked now because of the food question. And, but, and you, it was a question from you, now we have the free trade and agreements and the bilateral free trade agreements and you know that when of the big trade agreement is the uh, agreement between European Union and United States, which is negotiated now uh, for three years. And the pro the, the one of the sectors, or perhaps the fourth sector, which will, be, um, um, which will be touched by that, will be the, the, the agricultural sector. Why? Because in every other sector, uh, the trade barriers are now very low, low. But in the farm sector, you have still very high trade barriers. For example, for some meat products, you have berries uh, which are 100% of the value, okay, or 150% and so on. So some products are really highly protected now in Europe and less protected than in the United States. That's why, uh, generally, all the agricultural lobby uh, are against these free trade agreements. Because farmers know that they will be more touched than in the United States. So, because of the decreasing of trade barriers, 
And we know that we can, uh, what we have in mind now is a decreasing of 95% of all trade berries in the agricultural production. So it could be really a disaster, especially for the meat production. Uh, we know that it could be a disaster, especially because in United States, they, they really have comparative advantage. They have a, a big agricultural policy also with big, big subsidies. And they have a production which, which is highly concentrated. For example, I said in the milk sector, one, one half of the production is produced by a farm with more than 1,000 cows. It's amazing. Uh, this, is, uh, the, this is the same in meat production and so on. They have GMOs, uh, which is clearly a comparative advantage. Uh, they have hormones for cows, uh, which is clearly a comparative advantage and so on. And that we, um, we, we don't want this in Europe. And um, uh, moreover, so they want also to decrease sanitary barriers. And for, exa for example, Monsanto and biotech biotechnology enterprises said clearly that they wanted to prevent uh, some of our berries against the GMOs, for example. Okay. For example, they want that we export more uh, products with GMOs. We have a quite limited list compar compared to United States of products that we can consume. Uh, they want also perhaps to oblige farmers in the European Union to plant GMOs also, not also consumers to consume more GMOs, but also uh, uh, farmers to plant GMOs. Uh, but also uh, we, have, um, we, we have some, uh, um, we, we are afraid of also uh, uh, some other uh, regulations, like on, uh, I don't know, this is uh, ractopamine and so on. This is some quite, uh, some products which are used uh, in livestock production and which are not authorized in the in EU, but United States want to oblige us to use it and uh, or to I import products w uh, treated by this product, uh, with this uh, kind of pr uh, methods. And that's why, um, Many, many farm trade unions are against it, against this free trade agreement, even the main fa farm trade unions. Finally, this is not only, uh, so how could we say that? The problem is also that we have interests in EU to have these free trade agreements. Not the farmers, but the big firms, some of the big firms. And for example, in United States, they have a law that we don't have in EU. They have the possibility to favor local and small farms for um, uh, public markets. Uh, ah, les offres, les appels d'offres publics. Uh, well. Yes. Public good for yeah. Well, public call for tenders or uh, I would say, for example, for the meals of schools, you understand? Uh, we demand to some enterprises uh, to, um, uh, to sell products, okay? And in the United States, you have the right to favor local and small farms or local and small enterprises. In EU, you know that it's completely unauthorized. You cannot say, okay, I am a... I am a town and I am a region and I want my local products and not other ones. But in the United States, they can. This is the Buy American Act. This is a, a law in the United States, okay? And in, in European Union, we, uh, we want to remove it in the United States because we know that it will create new markets for big firms in the European Union. So I'm just explaining that it's not only Pro, uh, it doesn't only create problems in European Union, and that some of our big firms have also interest for having this free trade agreement in the United States. That's why we have an alliance of NGOs between European and American NGOs. 
And also many, many NGOs in the United States are against this free trade agreement because it will create also environmental and social damages in the United States. Is it clear that? Yeah. So, and also pesticides, for example, uh, they have some protection in the United States against some of our pesticides or, uh, and, or some other uh, products uh, in Europe, produced in Europe. And uh, uh, United States, um, in United States, uh, NGOs are afraid uh, because of that, because they think that uh, they, they they will import more products with pesticides from European Union. So, uh, last question, perhaps. Um, two, 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 two. Yes. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Perhaps uh, um, about the last question. Um, finally, what do we propose an NGO via Campesina and so on? Because there is a European platform and we have quite the same demands. I would say we have, for dem as demands, we have, we want to demand a strong. <coughs> what you say here, strong uh, uh, barrier, strong trade barrier, and to keep it, finally, more regulation of prices, because the prices are like that, and it fragilizes all the small and uh, all the small farmers, especially. So regulating prices or or it would be another uh, proposal, having subsidies which vary according to the level of prices and cost pr of production, which would be real subsidies for revenues and not given to farmers per hectare, uh, whatever, uh, whatever the, um, the price is. Or, uh, so the name is deficiency payment. It, was, it, it exists especially, it is a system of the United States. And we say, okay, we could do like the United States, at least having subsidies which vary according to the revenues. But we say also, we don't have to create dumping and to create overproduction on the international market. So we must, uh, we must really implement, as before, tools for regulating the volume of production like some kind of quotas, or we could say uh, for environmental reasons, we could say no more than, uh, I don't know, one co per hectare or something, which can, um, uh, which can maximize the volume of production, okay? And uh, in order to prevent overproduction at the European, uh, at the international level. So having a regulation uh, of uh, volumes. And finally, uh, more subsidies for, for less uh, favored areas, for mountains and so on, because the farms in these areas are disappearing very more quickly than in other areas for small farms and especially for farms which respect very high environmental constraints, okay, like organic farming and so on. And one proposal of many organizations in France would be we must um, have much subsidies for uh, towns, for municipalities, for uh, regions which, uh, uh, which wants to, to buy products from local and small farms and organic farms and so on. This would create, um, this would develop organic farming, small and, uh, small, f small and local farm which engage in environmental practices, okay? And this, for us, it has also a social value, a social objective, is that every little child, every, uh, all children could eat organic, uh, food, you know, because the problem is that today 
only a small part of the population can afford uh, this organic f uh, food. Not only because of the price, but also because of the information and so on. Only a very small part of the population, around 5% in France, consume organic food. And we say if we introduce perhaps 50% or, I don't know, 80% uh, of produ products in schools uh, with organic, uh, organic farming, we can allow every child to eat organic food. And this is also uh, a way for educating child, children to, uh, to organic and to good food and also uh, perhaps after to uh, ah, faire la cuisine. <laughs> for cooking. <laughs> for cooking and uh, so we really need also to educate population uh, why is it important to eat organic farming to, to also to cook because uh, uh, and to, to eat uh, fruits and so on and so we need also it would be a really good solution for having more and more this kind of development of agriculture. Because if you want more organic farming, more environmental agriculture, you must educate also, you, you must inform people uh, about that. So. Ready for questions from the audience? Who's got questions? That's fine. Hi. Um, I have two questions which are not very much related to the um, common agricultural policy, but I would like to ask your opinion. So last year in Italy we hosted the um, so-called Exposition Universelle Expo, and the main topic was uh, feeding the planet energy for life. So I went there. I, was, I decided to have a very optimistic and naive approach about it, but I was completely disappointed because I expected to go there and learn. I mean, it was something for the general public, so it didn't have to be very deep and um, academic. But yet, I went there expecting to learn something of what each country was doing in order to deal with the problem of uh, um, anger and how to create sustainable, de uh, sustainable development of food products. And, and basically everything I saw was just a tourist promotion of each country. But parallel to this, I, I know that there were some uh, conferences between uh, civil society, NGOs, um, lobbying um, activists, maybe lobbying activists, Yes, exactly. So uh, I was just wondering if anything relevant was agreed last year within this Expo framework, Every, anything that can be transferred maybe to the European Commission for further policy implementation, especially for what concerns this big imbalance between the strength of the European Union for what concerns these um, export subsidies whatsoever. So this is the first question, whether Expo played any relevant role in the discussion. And the second one is, um, do, do you have any opinion on the vegetarianism movement, which is somehow growing in Europe as a, as a way to deal with this emergency we are facing about uh, the, the under um, supplying of food, especially for emerging countries. So can it find any relevant place in the European agenda or promoting this policy and this new way of living uh, is just too expensive and not feasible from a political uh, perspective. So just those two. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, in fact, have a few questions, but I'll ask two. Uh, first, at the, at the very end of your presentation, you were talking about children and educating children about food, which I think is very important. Because agriculture is not a cool job, a cool profession. When, when, we, when we grew up, most of us, we didn't want to be a farmer. Okay? And we also see that as a country develops, 
the number of people into agriculture, it decreases. And it is considered a good thing because less people are into agriculture. And now we see that you know, unemployment is a big problem. So how do you think we can make agriculture a cool profession where intelligent people do farming and do good farming? And there is an example in France, and I don't know, how do you think about that example? It's like Ferme de Avenir. It's by some guy who is, whose name is Maxime de Rostelon. And Maxime de Rostelon. And he uses, my, he, they are doing micro farming using permaculture. And I don't know what you think about it. So this is one question. And another is uh, against a uh, question related to, not against, a standardization of agriculture. Now we see that everything is a standardized. Uh, we have a particular variety. Still in Europe it is less because GMOs are still far away. But this is against biodiversity. In nature, we don't have same size for everything. Mm, everything is, comes in different sizes and different colors, different shape. So can we really protect our agriculture industry, given that uh, firms like Monsanto playing big role in global pharmace uh, not pharmaceutical again, but uh, global agriculture industry? Thank you. I also want to thank you for your coming here, presenting your job. You made uh, our joint seminar today very interesting. Thank you. Um, actually, used to uh, make a big stimul in my ha my brain, so I have a lot of questions. But I ask you two. Uh, first question: um, You and this Kassant were mentioning about um, problems with. Uh, um lobbying so uh, rich industries um not very good for health for in, uh, environment ha um have a lot of money to lobbying but i want to ask um what kind of tools uh civil society has to influence somehow decision taking in europe maybe i don't know I actually I don't know what kind of tools NGOs or like uh, you are activists, so maybe you you can say this. Uh, this is important question. And another question is concerning uh, you. You say it's dumping. Uh, it's about um, trade agreements with uh, developing countries, poor countries. Um, so from. Um, First uh, January this year, the trade agreement, very controversial tra uh, trade agreement, is uh, uh, Im was implemented with Ukraine. Um, yeah, EU, EU and Ukraine. As I told you, it, w it is very controversial and actually now politically has very big consequences for Ukraine because all this political mess that starts starts with the signing or not signing this trade agreement. Um, and the positive part of this trade agreement for Ukrainian side, it was uh, clearly um, agriculture. Because um, the price is low in Ukraine the for labor, for everything, the currency much cheaper. So if you transfer it into Euro, the product it's much cheaper. And uh, Ukraine have, uh, as you told, it's not very fair maybe, because Ukraine has no so strong subsidies for, pr for uh, agricultural produ uh, production. And with lowering or demolishing these barriers, Ukraine really has um, see the, a lot of opportunities on that market. With uh, uh, with milk, with uh, meat, with uh, um, corns, different kind of corns. But uh, um, I want to know: is there any dumping? <laughs> is there is there something that I? Yeah. So I I see I know this uh, Ukrainian side, and they are very p optimistic in this in agricultural way. But now I am asking because you what you are saying I never thought about it, 
that Europe is very strong in subti subsidizing. And, uh, and also maybe some technical barriers or what they really can do that uh, makes this trade agreement not positive, even in this mon mostly positive uh, side. Thank you very much. Next one. Did I see one hand over here? We've got about 15 minutes, so I think this is going to be the only round of questions. So get all of them that we had. Oh, hi, uh, thanks. Uh, I haven't seen uh, some this theme, uh, so I don't know if it's a proper uh, question, but I would like to know your your opinion uh, about how uh, this policy affects the accountancy for overall productiv productivity in Europe. And I'm asking this because although we know this. Uh, accountancy methods are very problematic. The indicators we get still has a lot of impact on national on national policies. So, and because agriculture is usually less productive than industrial sector and service sector in Euro Europe, some could argue that the efforts for supporting this kind of activity could be preventing Europe from achieving higher levels of productivity, and uh, because you're supporting less productive sector, because you could spend this money to invest in more productive activities or supporting uh, uh, inefficient producers. So I would think if you think this is a valid argument, uh, especially because uh, this would be a case of a trade-off between productivity and other economic and social goals that national accountancy can't grasp. So I think it's a valid critique. And I would th think to know your opinion about that. Thank you. Last call for questions. Okay. And very quick answers. Yeah, um, just w wondering quickly about this whole like um, fair trade movement. Um, do you think if it's actually like a viable strategy for developing countries in order to tap into developed countries' markets? Given all these asymmetric relations that you were talking about, and if it can be scaled up, or how viable is it for for developing countries to adopt? And what well, do we have one more? We might not have time to answer them all, but we can at least ask them all. I, I will be quick. Um, I will, um, as you said, uh, the PAC was introduced uh, uh, to guarantee and ensure peace after in the context of uh, Second World War. Uh, but uh, do you think um, in the situation that uh, there is now, it, it will uh, be dismantled eventually? Since, uh, uh, for instance, uh, after being stored, the entire batches of production were destroyed. So this um, raised a lot of critics um, in a lot of countries and uh, also where um, in a context where, of course, consumers' money uh, is transferred to farmers of other European countries, do you think uh, there is a context for it to be dismantled and other solutions? Okay. If uh, in the PAC uh, there is a context for the PAC to be dismantled, and uh, the if there could be alternative solutions, do you um, and what is your opinion? Yes, if it will ever be. Dismantled. All right, let's. We got ten minutes, so I'll start waving once we're out of time. Anyway, well, one question was about the, the movements, uh, alternative progressive movements, the vegetarians movements. We, yeah, I think what is positive in this period is that uh, in France, at least, but even more in Germany and some other countries in Europe, we have more and more movements, uh, citizen movements not only farm movements, but only uh, also consumer movements for having another agriculture and another aliment uh, food, okay? Um, especially in Germany, more than in France, I'm going the next weekend to Berlin for a big demonstration, which is uh, 50,000 uh, of, uh, of people uh, the last year in the, in the streets only for another food, another agriculture and so on. So that's amazing. And uh, 50,000 people in Berlin just demonstrating for another agriculture. 
And so this will be the next weekend, but it shows you that uh, th there are many movements now uh, trying to change, to change agriculture and food because they are seeing that what happens in the farms is really important for consumers, for citizens and so on. This is not only a question of farmers. And this is really important because the Via Campesina and Confederation Paysanne want to change things uh, alone. And they, they know that they, they need consumers and so on. Vegetarian movement. So I think, oh, I'm not vegetarian, but I think it's really important what they say because obviously we need to, to consume less meat. And uh, I love to eat meat, honestly. But I think that we need uh, an, uh, another livestock production with more extensive uh, production, uh, less cost per hectare, and uh, with grass and so on. Perhaps we need to buy um, a, a more expensive meat uh, and to eat uh, less meat, uh, which is produced in another conditions. But anyway, the vegetarian movement has, on my mind, useful uh, arguments uh, for changing production anyway. In France, you have now a new movement, which is L214, which is quite well known because it shows uh, di the disaster in, um, in the industry of meat and so on. And it has quite impacts on people, and that's fine for me. So it helps, uh, anyway, even if I'm not vegetarian. And I think we need uh, people with livestock production because uh, we need grass. And uh, also, it has a good impact on biodiversity, on soil, on water, and so on. And if you want grass, you need milk and, <laughs> and meat production. But anyway, that's a debate. Uh, uh, the, how could it be a cool profession? It could, be a cool, uh, it could be a cool profession if you have revenues which are, more, uh, which are uh, less volatile. Okay, So you need to regulate prices. But also, I think uh, perhaps and it corresponds to another, uh, another question, um, the productivity. So I said, now I think that the, the question is not to increase production per hectare, per worker, per all, OK? The question is not to sell uh, with a bigger value, so, uh, but to sell with a, a bigger, with a higher uh, added value which means that you can have um, environmental, social, and economic sustainability, okay, and good results um, um, uh, together, okay? Um, increasing added value for that, you need to decrease uh, machines, fertilizers, uh, soya, because uh, it's uh, you, and so now we show that you can be, uh, you can have a, a higher added value with environmental, more, more positive environmental and social aspects with more employers per hectare and so on, with this kind of production. For example, in the milk sector, with grass and so on, you can have a higher added value. So you can be in organic farming, for example, with grass, with cows. Uh, pasturing and so on, and you can have a, a, a good, you can obtain a good income, and you can have um, um, more comfortable conditions of working because you don't have pesticides, which are a, a disaster for health. Uh, you you can be together now. You can group together, perhaps for for example, three farmers uh, between them. Uh, and so you can have vacancies, uh, holidays, and so on. So there are solutions now, but I think you need for that a, 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 really, strong a really strong transformation of the farm development. And on my mind, towards environmental and social uh, orientations, and not uh, an intensification, uh, increasing of productivity, and so on. Secondly, I think that what is important now in, in Europe is not decreasing strongly the production because we need to food ourselves, but 
we need to restore uh, the sufficiency in some products, perhaps less exports and less imports. This will be better for environmental aspects because of the, cost of the environmental cost of uh, transport, but it will be also better for consumers because they will know how it, uh, their, their, food, their food is produced. So, you know, if you um, make the distance shorter between producers and consumers, consumers will be, uh, will be informed about how we produce food. I don't know, perhaps some of you have relations with farmers which produce food? No? Perhaps some of you uh, know farmers and uh, perhaps they buy food to some farmers? Only you? In farms or uh, in groups of farmers which are in turns but you know the farms and how they produce food? Yeah. Then they you La ruche. Yeah. Yes. They the only one problem is that it is possessed. It is uh, uh, so you have uh, okay. It's uh, nil and so on. So the um, it's financed by big fi big uh, firms and so on. But anyways, the idea is good, but it's not purely uh, uh, yes. But you have a development of uh, AMAP in France. This is how, what is the name in Europe? Uh, shortened uh, supply chains. Uh, there is a, a name, but I don't know anymore. So this is direct relations between farmers and consumers. And uh, you buy your food to one farmer. You, have, you are a group of consumers and you buy to your farm, to your farmers. And this is developed. Yes. This has different names in countries, but there is a big movement about uh, in that. There, uh, sometimes also there, are there, there is creation of cooperative supermarkets. There, there will be a new one in Paris uh, this year. Like in Marseille, there is this thing where you can subscribe to a, subscribe to a basket. Yes. Every week you get a basket of uh, like Paris fruits. Is, and in Paris, you can work with them. Yes. Like I think this is the name of AMAP in yeah, France. Yes, that's it. Local community of farmers. This is the name, the European name. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yes. So you use that. I tried it for like in months. Okay. Not myself, but I have a friend. He has a subscription. Yeah. So, so everyone can do this. You, 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 you put the question. What can we do? You can, as consumer, you can do this. You can subscribe to some kind of. Uh, collective of local community of farmers and consumers. You can, uh, you can go to an organic supermarket or uh, the best is not supermarket, the best is a local cooperative of farmers. For example, in my town, Montreuil, you have Nouveau Robinson, which is a, a cooperative uh, supermarket. This is, uh, this is not, uh, this is a uh, uh, this is financed by consumers and by farmers, okay? Uh, so you have solutions at the individual level, but also you can, uh, uh, you can be active as an uh, activist in uh, very different movements, slow food in Italy, and uh, in, all, in every country you have, uh, you have uh, some solutions to do that. In France, uh, okay, obviously in attack, but also in, some, in, in every a friend of the earth, so you have you have many organizations which are engaged in some uh, in, in this kind of uh, also terre de lien. This is also uh, another way you buy uh, a little part of land and you install some farm some farmer uh, on this uh, on this uh, surface. Okay, so you have many solutions for, f but. I know this is not very well known now, but I hope that this movement will grow and that we will be able to inform all citizens to what can be done. And um, finally, um, I cannot answer to, to all of that, but just about the, the Ukraine. 
Okay, you, you spoke about uh, a free trade agreement uh, between Ukraine and European Union. I think, yes, obviously, the, the main argument of uh, the liberals is for agriculture. Okay, like as consumers, you will have lower prices. But what is the impact on the farmers? And the problem is that in Ukraine, you have, also, you have still a big part of people, of workers in the farm sector. But if you liberalize markets, first you will import more food, I think so, because we have big subsidies and you don't have big subsidies in Ukraine. And this is clear that it will be not a, a, fair, a, a fair trade. And uh, also, when you have liberalization of markets and when you increase export, uh, also you fragilize small farms. And the problem will be um, that the small farms will be fragilized and, uh, and, uh, and finally f f won't be able to export and will be um, in competition with uh, the production of very bigger farms. Uh, of European Union. But I know that in Ukraine the main problem is that the is, is the land grabbing. I think so. In Ukraine this is really the example of land grabbing from European farmers, especially European financiers and uh, which uh, which uh, <coughs> buy farms in Ukraine and which create amazing farms but the profits are not for for people in Ukraine. The profits are for people in European Union, which bought uh, the farms in Ukraine. And uh, I know that because many farmers, many rich farmers in France, when they had the very high prices in 2012, they bought a lot of farms in Ukraine because they had a lot of profits thanks to the subsidies of CAP and they invested in, uh, in farms in Ukraine. And now there are profits for them, but this is not for the Ukraine. And that's the problem of land grabbing. But anyway, that's just an example of the problem created by liberalization. That's why, on my mind, th there is a big problem with that. But anyway, perhaps in tw 10 years, leaders, political leaders will see all of that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. But you can get the land almost forever. So it's like almost for forever. It's like yeah. to be yeah. like 100 years. Yeah. So it's but like um, mm. um, it's like looking nice, but inside it's very rotten, you know? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very good uh, soil for land grabbing, especially for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's clear. And, uh, but that's why it's a big phenomenon. Uh, no. Okay. Over. Um, so I am. Thank our speaker and go get lunch. Thanks to you. <laughs>